All right, simple question. Who wants to win this year? Sharks. They want to win. If you're a Bulls supporter, welcome to Shark Country. It's dangerous out here for people like you. I know you're big, but we're brave. Everyone wants to win, right? And the question we've been asking this year is, what about if it's less about what you accomplish and more about your approach? Like, what if winning this year was less about the score on the board and more about the effort behind the scenes? Like, Craig Rochelle has this really cool quote. He says, so often it's the thing that nobody wants to do that gives you the results that everybody wants. Or the things that nobody sees that give you the results that everybody wants to. There's something about the behind the scenes that that is not that sexy, but very powerful. And so we thought we'd start a series this year uh, and kind of play with the word win, because we all want to win, but ask the question, what are you putting in? What are you putting in? My daughter, week two, last week, we missed week one as church. We were on holiday still. Week two, we got back. She came to me afterwards. She said, Dad, I'm not sure who came up with win, but that's pretty cool. What are you putting in, Dad? I said, you picked up on that? She was just here for worship. She saw the graphics outside. She said, yo, we spoke about it in transit. Um, and I was just so encouraged because to ask the question, what you're putting in, is perhaps to save us from a wasted year. It's to stop us from running out of energy in July. I think the last two weeks, Mark has preached outstanding messages on putting wisdom into your life. First week, there's a way to win. It's fascinating how every year, the first message of the year is the most watched message of the year. Every year on YouTube. This year was no different. Because people know they've got to start strong. What you're putting in? Well, there's a way to win. Second week, minding your mind. Feed, free, focus. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. I want to jump straight in. This year, I want you to give God permission to speak to you by His Word. I know you like church. I know your kids have an absolute blast next door. I know you see good people and the coffee's amazing and worship is off the charts. But I want to encourage you this year to feed on His Word like you never have before. Bring your Bibles to church if I can encourage you to do that. Bring your bread, as we said last week. Bring your bread. Make sure you get full up before you walk outside and you smell that croissant because it's going to catch you. Proverbs chapter 3.13, blessed is the man who finds wisdom. I like that word, finds. It suggests, it suggests there's a search. Blessed is the man or woman who finds wisdom. The man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver. He yields better returns than gold. Like, you read that like it's cool poetry, but guys, think about that. This is the wisest man, as we understand, to have lived outside of Jesus, saying, um, You know, blessed is the man or woman that finds wisdom, for it's more profitable than silver and better return than gold. Like, I want to tap into a different economy this year, if I can be straight up. She's more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and her paths are peace. She, wisdom, is a tree of life to those who embrace her, to those who lay hold of her, they will be blessed. James chapter 1, we're going to jump to three scriptures to get set up today. James chapter 1 verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all, this is beautiful, without finding fault, and it will be given to him, which is to suggest that you asked for wisdom last week, you squandered it, now you're back not sure if he wants to give you a little bit extra. And God says, i got so much in my tank. There is so much excess for anybody who would be willing or humble to ask for more of it that there will never be short supply of wisdom. Like in the world, there may be. The books on the shelf run dry. Five points to, three steps from, seven keys. They're all amazing helpful principles. But I want to tell you right now, the source is local. I want to tap into an eternal source. And what God is saying is to anyone this year, Link Church, friends online, who asks for wisdom, I'm talking about from a two-year-old who's willing to speak those words, to the 88-year-old that's not sure they have anything left to offer, to anyone who asks for wisdom, God will give freely without fault. He's not going to judge you on last week's performance before He doses you with this week's opportunities. Oh, I love my heavenly Father. 
and it'll be given to him. All right, last one, Proverbs 25. We're going to hang in this one today. Verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal the matter. Hang on a second. He who finds wisdom more precious than gold and silver, he who asks for wisdom, there is excess, but God conceals things. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search, to search out a matter is the glory of kings, leaders. If you are a young person that has aspirations and have influence over young people in your world, you're a leader. It's your glory to search things out. Your privilege. Glory speaks of respect or privilege. So it's the respect, it's the kindness of God respectfully toward us to conceal certain things. And it's the respect of man toward God to seek them out. Oh, I'm going to get excited this year, church. You see, God is calling us to a journey, a pursuit of wisdom. What are you putting in? What does it look like for wisdom to get in? But something you need to know in this pursuit is it's not just going to fall from the sky. You're going to have to journey toward it in your life. I want to speak today, the title of my message is quite simply, A Holy Curiosity. What a word. A holy curiosity, write that down. And I guess what I'm trying to ask you in a spiritual sense is when was the last time you made a new discovery in your Christian walk for the first time? When was the last time you stumbled upon a new truth in God's Word and were captivated by it? When was the last time uh, you read a story that you've read a thousand times last year, Tess uh, read the Bible story to our children every night, and then I would go and pray for them. And I would find myself sitting on the couch in the lounge, normally like scrolling numbness, numbingly through like Instagram, overhearing Tess reading the story. My favorite was Esther. And as she was reading it, I found myself putting my phone down and being captivated by parts of Esther that I hadn't yet seen. To the point where, where I'd pray for the children, I'd pray in line with what she had just read because it had just captivated my heart in a new way. I wonder how many of us are praying new prayers in line with fresh revelations and calling us forward into new seasons and faith this year. Because God wants us to live by, I want to say it a few times today, a holy curiosity. A holy curiosity. It was curiosity that led Moses to the burning bush to ask this question. Why is it that the bush burns all by itself and yet it does not burn up? I'm going to go a little bit closer. What is it in the scripture story? Maybe there's some people here today I want to speak to you who are new to this church space, but you're curious and you're not sure that your curiosity has a place here. You think you have to have it all worked out. You think you have to be able to quote 10 scriptures on the back of your hand. You think you need another five steps toward perfect spirituality. But actually, God's just calling you to holy curiosity. He wants you to be inquisitive of Him. He wants you to ask questions of Him. He wants you to seek things out in the scriptures. He wants you to go in pursuit of Him. It is the glory of God to conceal things. That means respectfully He holds certain things from us. Why? Because He wants us to seek them out. Because in seeking we find. Eugene Peterson says it so beautifully. He says, the assumption of spirituality is that God is always doing something before I know it. So the task is not to get God to do something I think needs to be done, but to become aware of what God is already doing so that I can respond and participate and take delight in it. God wants us as a church to take delight. This holiday, um, we went down the West Coast. It was amazing. And on the way home, we stopped off in Otsurn. I mean, who, wow, why would you do that? Think about it. Afrikaans and Otsurn, you should try it out. It's awesome. And so when you're in Otsurn, what do you do? Kango Caves, of course. Um, and so off we go to Kango Caves. And we debated that morning, to be fair, whether we should go. And no, it was really hot and we weren't sure. We thought of just swimming. And uh, my friend Dubs, he said, you know, once we're in the cave, we'll be grateful we were there. So I'm like grateful for that moment. So we get in the car, we drive off, we get to Kango Caves, we pay our ticket prices, we go up, we walk inside. And truth be told, once we walked into the caves, I was last there when I was really small. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's pretty spectacular. It really is spectacular. And the way that they've leveraged it as a tourist site, I know with the World Cup that came through our country, they ramped things up. And, and the whole experience, the, the tour guide was exceptional. I, I, I don't even, I wish I was more like him and how I told the Bible story. But he told the story of how the Kanga Caves was discovered. And there we are standing in the cave. 
And in the cave, all the lights are on, and you can see the stalactites and stalagmites, and you know all the things that make the cave what it is, and it's this big, beautiful space. And no one noticed it, but in the corner of the cave, there was a little oil lamp burning ever so slightly. And he explained how this explorer had kind of got on this journey and was journeying through the mountains. And I'm like locked in. I'm thinking like, what happened next? And he said, next he walked into the cave. And with that, the lights tripped pitch black. My little boy, Joel, just squeezed my arm a little bit tighter. Pitch black. And he said, and all he had was a little lamp. And there in the corner of the cave, the space was probably about the size of this auditorium we were standing in was a little, little oil lamp burning red. I honestly couldn't see more than 20 centimeters left and right of it. And he said, I forget his name now, he said he walked in with this little oil lamp and all he did was take step after step only to discover four stages of the Kango Caves, which are kilometers long. It, It was this amazing discovery. And as he said that, I was thinking, that's so beautiful. He went on a curious journey with just a little bit of light. And he was willing to take the little light he had and take a step forward with it. He was willing to take another step and then another step and then another step until kilometers of beautiful what we now know as Kango Caves were uh, were discovered. But the truth is it was just a little bit of light. And I wondered this year as we approach this season of winning and putting wisdom in and going on a journey, I wonder if every week we could just allow Jesus, come on church, to give us just a little bit of light. And with a little bit of light, the kind of courage it takes just to take another step, just one other step. For you, it may be learning to be generous this year. For you, it may be learning to serve God this year. For you, it may be just saying, Jesus, I've never even embraced you in my heart this year. Just another little step with a little bit of light. And I can't imagine the kind of cavity of joy that's going to open up in your life as you pursue the things of God with just a little bit of light. We don't need floodlights. The Bible says the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my heart. We just need a little bit of light and the courage to take another step. Holy curiosity. I'm told that the mind typically has two halves. I know know I'm simplifying it, but the half that uh, has new discoveries and the half that makes sense of the new discoveries. I love it how Einstein said, uh, never lose a holy curiosity. For once a mind is open to a new idea, it never returns to its original size. Profound. And so this mind of ours is always looking to make new discoveries and then, and then expanding in its understanding of them. Uh, one um, connection between curiosity and wisdom that I read I really liked, it says, curiosity runs down the path of inquiry, imagination, and joy. Wisdom directs it to its proper orientation. Do I like that you speak about curiosity, but I'm more on the wisdom track. That's awesome. You won't gain wisdom unless you go in a pursuit of curiosity. Because curiosity is kind of like the little thing that takes you on a journey toward understanding how things came to be. But I'm just going to make clinical decisions, not without some curious creativity. You know, you, you, you've probably heard the, the, the psychological kind of advantage of a two-year-old is its ability to learn or his or her ability to learn. The two or three-year-old phenomena, they call it. My little boy is three. He's a phenomena. Because his appetite to grow and learn, is it's insatiable. To the point where sometimes I just, I just leave the room. I got nothing left to say. Dad, why, why this? Dad, what about that? Dad, and if this the other day we were in the garden and I was doing some like, uh, I was putting some compost on the trees and he says, Dad, why do you put compost on the trees? And my adult mind goes, how do I explain the process of plant growth and photosynthesis to this three-year-old child? So I say to him something half ridiculous and he says to me, just tell me how it really works, Dad. <laughs> so I explained photosynthesis, best I knew how. The curiosity, the two, three-year-old imagination. I want to tell you, friends, there's something beautiful about where I'm going in the story today. Holy curiosity, winning. They, they say that a child's mind is like a sponge. Proverbs 25 says, glory of God to conceal things, the glory of kings, you and I, to seek them out. But to seek out the secrets and the treasures of heaven, oh, church, there's good things for you now this year. We have to become more like children. It's interesting to me how at two, proven, it's the most exponential growth phase of your life. Exponential. And it's because of? 
And then we hit 40, 50, 60, 70, and we feel like we're stagnating and we're not sure that we're contributing back to society. And we start to ask big, brave questions of where our life's going and where our lives. And these are all very honest questions. I want to partner with you and say you're very human if you're asking those kind of questions. Here's the little challenge I have for you today. If a two-year-old has the kind of capacity that causes exponential growth, which is what makes that child want to grow into what God has for them, why is it that we stop being curious when we're 70 as if there's a new formula? Now, do I found my path? Really? You, you've discovered phase one of the Kango Cave, sir. Dill, I've, I've, been, I've been doing this Jesus thing for 40 years. You're not going to swing me now. No, I won't. But if you give God permission, he might. And when he does, you're going to go on a journey you never thought was possible. Seven-year-old, seven-year-olds in the room, six-year-olds in the room, 80-year-olds in the room. Yeah, I do. I'm just not sure it works like that. You could attain to more in your life than the next five, six, ten years than some of us over the next 20 if you just maintain to be curious. Traits of curiosity released by Harvard. Shout out to Harvard for giving us information that helps us. They've shown that whether you're two or 80, this is what it looks like when you're curious. You have a high tolerance of anxiety. You embrace uncertainty like no one on the planet. You have positive emotional expressiveness. It's not, it's not me. It's, it's Harvard. <laughs> you initiate humor and play frequently. You have this progressive, unconventional way of thinking. To be curious. But this is my favorite one. Curious people stand out as they are non-defensive and non-critical in all of their attitude. So let me flip it around just so we can go on a journey, church. Do you have a high tolerance of anxiety? Are you good at embracing uncertainty? Are you positive in your emotional expressiveness? Or are you in a critical cycle? Do you frequently initiate humor and play? Do you find yourself thinking of new and progressive ways to do the same old things? Or, more importantly, are you non-defensive and non-critical in rooms full of people? Because I think the invitation of heaven today as we go on a pursuit of winning is to invite us in again on a holy curiosity journey. It is the glory of God to conceal things. Church, He's being kind and respectful by holding certain things from us. But it's the glory of kings. It's our respect toward him to seek them out. It's respectful to God when we're curious about the things of God. It's almost like going, God, we honor you for what you've designed around us by being curious for what lies in front of us. I believe God wants us to embrace a holy curiosity. And so I've got two simple ways to do that, two simple ideas today in church. The first is called what Gordon MacDonald calls the privilege of discovery. What a beautiful language for it. The privilege of discovery. Listen to what he writes in this book, Ordering Your Private World. I hope this is ministering to you, my friends online. He writes, it would, be, it would do us good to see ourselves as sponges. Tap your neighbor and say, you look like one. What I meant is you're holy. Just tap your neighbor, explain the joke, please. Some guys are still catching him. All right. It'd be good to see ourselves as sponges. Throughout the expanse of creation, God has hidden things for humankind to discover, to enjoy, and with which to perceive the nature of the Creator Himself. We should sponge it all up, per se. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It's the glory of God to conceal the matter, but the glory of kings to search out that matter. The work of the first man and woman was essentially to discover and identify things that God had made. Because of their disobedience against God's laws, some of the opportunity for that kind of marvelous work was forfeited. Now they had to worry more about surviving in a hostile world than continuing to discover what was in it. The nature of work abruptly changed. I have a conviction that the heavenly life will be in some way a recovery of the original form of work. But the principle and the privilege of discovery still prevails in part. Some discoveries come through hard physical labor, such as digging gold out the side of a hill. Other discoveries are made as we observe the progress of living things in the plant, animal, and human kingdoms. And much of the exploration of creation is done purely within the mind, 
We dig, as it were, and we uncover ideas and truths. And then we turn around to express them artistically, worshipfully, and inventively. Thinking is a great work. I think it was Oliver Wendell that said, um, men of action control the present, but it's the thinkers who have the future. That's beautiful. God wants us this year, church, to engage him in a new privilege of discovery. He wants us to see him in the humans around us that surprise us with the genius that we don't understand. He wants us to see him in the sunrises. He wants us to to watch him in the strategy that unfolds in businesses that seemed so obvious and then took a journey and someone said, wow, and then God starts to move and and we just, we just, we're inquisitive and we're curious. The privilege of discovery. God wants us to open this word daily and not feel burdened by the outcome. Can you quote the scripture? But feel overjoyed by the journey. Did you see more of me? Did you see me in the fall of Babylon? Did you see me in the rise of my Jewish people? Did you you watch that when I got in the boats and I left the shore and they tried to follow me thinking what they wanted was a miracle, but actually what they came back for was a meal? Did you see it? Did you see me when I spoke to 5,000 people? And then left in a leper who had been hiding in the rock, stopped by me and asked me to touch him, and I touched him. Did you see that part? Or did you miss it? God, feed the next 5,000. But what about the one? The privilege of discovery. I've been, I've been so grateful for these two weeks. Um, really stirred in my spirit. You know, confidence is, confidence is purely in Christ, I've realized. You can fake confidence in your natural ability, but it ends. And no, no one's impressed by that. But godly confidence sees itself through seasons, shows itself up on the mountains and in the valleys. And I think some of the power of a godly confidence or some of the fuel of that is in holy curiosity. God, I'm searching you out. I'm trying to see how you operate. I want to know who you are. Because when I show up, I don't want to show up limited to this temple that's on earth. I want to show up with this temple filled with the Spirit of God that's gifted by heaven. I change things. I change rooms. Prophesy of you business people. Your strategic solutions won't change rooms. The Spirit of God in your life will, though. Show up. Your presence will shift things. Not your knowledge. Your presence will shift things. I declare. I prophesy. The confidence of a church walking in step with the Spirit of God. Oh, Jesus, I know you're pleased by this. I was reading a book um, called The History of the World. My wife buys these random books, Georgia. History of the World. Like, I'm struggling with 2020 and 2021, and I'll be honest. Like, I'm not really cared about 56 BC. And uh, I learned something. Go figure. That Baghdad was originally the wealthiest Islamic state and to this day the wealthiest Islamic city and possibly city that's ever been. Did you know that? Don't answer. But while dad, Baghdad, dad bag, was exploding, the Christian world was stagnating. Did you know that part? While new trade routes were being opened, and new trades and precious stones and chemicals, minerals, was expanding and growing and becoming the most prolific economy that's been, the Christian world was standing still, and it bugged me. And we're told, as good as he was as a leader, I believe it was Augustine, believed that curiosity and understanding were a human disease. And of course, his approach was the negative side, like the need to know curiosity of everyone else's business. But what he did was he impacted the thinking of humanity in this world, Christianity, and made it small. 
And while the Christian world, gifted by God with the privilege of discovery in the Garden of Eden, while it defaulted to a small mindset, religious, stagnated thinking, the Islamic State blew up. Good on them. And I felt God saying to me, teach the church about curiosity again. Break the mindset that we weren't meant to be curious. I bind the person. Just joking. I'm not going to do that in church today. I bind statements like we don't do it like that. Bind declarations of that will never work. We're curious. Sons and daughters of God. It's got a little bit of light and a whole lot of courage and curiosity. The privilege of discovery. The privilege of discovery. May God give you this appetite this year to discover new things in Him. I wonder what's possible in your life if you made some of your own discoveries this year. I hope that when we feed you as a church, we give you appetite to feed on God's Word. But I hope you go home and you meditate and you mull it and you think on it. And as you do that, you see new things. You discover new things. You, you expand your understanding of the kingdom of God on earth. The privilege of discovery. The second thing I felt God say teach you about today and hope this is helping you is the practice of conversation. We live in a world of conclusions. And we're desperate for the next one. Because conclusions are often easier to handle than conversations. One of the, um, one of the things we can be sure of with social media, experts are telling us there's many differing opinions on it. There's many good things. There's many bad things. You know that. We're not against it. We think it's a gift in many ways if it's used properly. One of the things that it has restricted is the ability for people to converse effectively. Strange, yeah, you wouldn't have thought that. That's not the thing that I would go at if I was talking about technology. But interestingly enough, social media has restricted a generation from learning how to converse effectively. And so we make a statement in social media, it comes across as a conclusion. It doesn't ask the question, it doesn't invite somebody else into the story, it just suggests it is what it is. And so if you're young and immature and unconscious, you take it at face value, but it may not be the truth. And the kingdom of heaven is, is wooing us back into it. It's the glory of God to conceal things. It's the privilege of man to seek them out. The privilege of discovery and the practice of conversation. In the book of um, Matthew, there are three times Jesus asks the question, what do you think? Jesus asked it. When last did you ask somebody else, what do you think? Three times in the book of Matthew, the genius himself begins his story with what do you think? The first, I believe, was when they were talking about taxes. That would be a good one to start with. But of course, you're not going to ask your friend what they think of taxes because you might have to do it properly. That's something else we should talk about another time. But the first one is Jesus talking about taxes, and he says, you're going to find a coin in the fish's mouth. But before he gets there, he says, what do you think? I, I want you to process, because re remember, the, the man of action controls the present, but the thinker has the future. The curious one is way ahead of the game. The, 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 the one that's searching out things that others have stagnated on is, is going on ahead. Curiosity is not a disease, it's a gift. The second one, I believe, is... Um, when he was talking about, what was it, the two sons, he invites them to dress the vineyard or to work the vineyard, and he's explaining what it means to honor God with our time. But before he gets to the story, he says, what do you think? So beautiful. What do you think? You see, what God is doing, I want to say this, church, to my friends online this year, is he's inviting us in on a conversation. And it's not a social media conversation. You don't read the scripture and like it. You read the scripture and you, lever, you, 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 you sit in it and you meditate on it and you chew on it. I like it. Double tap. Like, did my time in the word for the day. Do you know, I find one of the greatest ways to read the Bible is not to close it. Is to leave it open. What I mean by that is you may read a scripture at 7.30. Think of it at 10.30. Uh, the story, be curious. God, why am I stuck in the book of 
Proverbs, or God, why have you led me to the story of Kings, or God, why can't I progress from Matthew chapter 5, or God, why John? Just be curious. Just hang out there, because I'm telling you, there are solutions to your business's growth in that space. There are, there are changes for your family's dynamic. My children and us, we're just, we're just not connecting, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write statements on the wall. I'm going to put processes in place in my home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them what I think. Good luck. I'm going to converse with heaven. Can I give you some free advice? God loves your kids more than you do. Can I keep going? God cares about your business growth more than you do. Oh, that was personal. So talk to him. Talk to him. When last did you ask God what he thinks? Holy curiosity. So simple. So profound. I remember a story, Jason Upton, a songwriter, a uh, very well-studied theologian, writes some beautiful music. But there's this, this song he writes about being a child. He's, it's called Into the Sky, I think. And he speaks about how God is wanting to throw us as his children up into the sky in this, in this world of freedom and fun and joy. And so the song is expressing it. And I believe that for you, by the way. If you feel like your life is very stagnated and very heavy on the ground, this year God wants to lift you. He wants to give you flight. He wants to give you curiosity. He wants to put you in the sky again. He wants to help you see things from a different vantage point, like a young child that just can't get enough of being thrown into the pool, up and down and up and down and up and down. Throw me again, Dad. There's something beautiful God wants to do in our lives and our, in our hearts. And he writes the song, and there's this one point in the song where he stops, and he says his little boy Samuel walks into the room and asks him a question. He says he looks up at his bookshelf, and on the bookshelf he has, he has layers of, of, of good theology, like, like pristine theology, like some of the greatest voices and critics and commentators of our time. And as it goes higher, the books become more profound, so to speak. And, and his little boy looks at him, he says, Dad... If I throw toys at those books, do you think they'll come alive? He said, God starts to speak to him. It's time to throw two-year-old curiosity at age-old truth, friends. It's time to wake up and give God our two-year-old imaginative curious selves. You're going to have to put your big adult boots on when you leave the home. I get that. Life's, life doesn't give you that privilege of staying too. But when you're with your heavenly Father, Jesus said in Matthew, said, unless you become like a child, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not eternity. You'll be saved, set free, and enjoy eternity. Taken care of, done deal. The train's taking you home. But you will not enjoy the kingdom expression here on earth unless you become like a child. The privilege of discovery and the practice of conversation. The practice of conversation. Can I encourage you when you're conversing with God? Don't question Him. Ask questions to him. It's different. You know, you know when you're in a room and, and, and anyone got a question and someone says, yeah, it's not really a question. I just want to say something. No, that's questioning. You, you, you're dismantling everything productive that this room is doing right now out. <laughs> anyway, but, but there's something beautiful about someone's genuine like curiosity and desire to, to learn and to grow. Hey, I have a question. Like, why does it work like that? I have a question. Why do you build church like this? Have you, uh, not really a question, it's a statement. You know, I've been to 10 churches, and the one thing I think you should think about, bless you, sir, I've got 10 other churches, you're going to really love it there. Because the goal of good conversation is not to be questioning of the person you're conversing with. It's the quickest way to end a healthy relationship. They're just going to feel disarmed every time. They're going to feel like you're condescending all the time. They're going to feel like you have no interest in, their, in what they add to the conversation. Hey, listen, newsflash, everyone has value to add to a conversation. What do you think? This week we welcomed five interns onto our team. Yeah, come on, I got excited. Creative interns. And they did the Gallup Strengths Finder. Young, young, young people, most of them are just out of school. They did the Gallup Strengths Finder. And in Gallup, there's four quadrants. There's execution, there's relationship, there's influence, and there's strategy, which is around thinking. And our team is quite broad-based. We have a good spread of all these different gifts. Do you know that these five interns, they just camped in strategy? This new generation is curious. They're curious. And I want to encourage you as a church, to st don't squash curiosity. You've got dreams. You've got desires. Ask good questions. Go to your heavenly Father. Seek Him out. I want to close with a story. Um, you know the story all so well. 
uh, it's the story of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a religious ruler. Um, you know, we don't carry the title of Pharisee these days. But sometimes we can self-proclaim think we're <laughs> like a rob, do you know, Ash? Um, and so Nicodemus was profiled in the religious sect. And he comes to Jesus curiously. And I have a hunch, friends, that there are people in this room today as I speak of curiosity that have been like checking the God story out from a distance. Almost like doing church because you enjoy it, but you're not sure what it means to just to give Jesus your life. I want to read the Nicodemus story to you because I hope that you have the courage of Nicodemus to approach Jesus this morning and to respond accordingly. John chapter 3. In fact, stand with me. Let's stand together as we read God's Word. John chapter 3. Holy curiosity. There are new things for you this year. You're going to discover things that mom never saw and things that dad never believed. You're going to discover things that your friends don't think are possible and that you never thought was on your life. Friends, curiosity, a holy curiosity is going to lead you to spaces this year that you never dreamed about. Watch this. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. It says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. And he came to Jesus at night. And he said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher that, have, that had come from God. He, he knew who Jesus was. For no one could perform the miraculous signs that you're doing if you're not with them, if God were not with them. And Jesus replied and said, I declare, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Nicodemus, curiously, I believe, asks this question. How can a man be born when he's old? Some of you are standing in this room. How can I be born again when my time on earth feels done? How can there be a second shot at this thing where I seem to have burnt every option that I've ever had? How can God afford me the gift of new life where I've just squandered the one that I always had? Unless he's born again. He says, how can a man be born again, he asks. Surely he cannot enter his mother's womb for a second time, friends. Christianity is not a religious set of principles. It's a relational invitation to conversation with your heavenly Father by the presence of God through the person of Jesus. You cannot enjoy the things of God in human flesh. You must be born again. You have to hand over the driving system of your life to the Spirit of God through the person of Jesus. And Jesus answers, I'll tell you the truth, can't be born again unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Nicodemus, my friend, you must be born again. I wonder if we can trust God for the curious question this year, God, what does it look like for my life to be born again? What does it look like for my friends' lives to be born again? Come on, pray with me.